going to be talking about not particularly one specific academic principle of organizational design. I'm going to be talking about um, a framework or a model that I've kind of pieced together over the years looking at organizational design and talking about a whole bunch of things that fall into the practice of organizational design. And I said things for every leader to think about. And I guess in terms of, um, I, I come from a tech and agile background, but, um, but I feel that, you know, we all know that leadership is is not just a hierarchical role. It's, uh, it's anyone who's influencing or trying to change an organization. Um, and uh, and so, so I think anyone who's doing any kind of uh, agile coaching or, or scrum mastering or, or simply influencing a team in, in, a, in a great agile environment is, is going to be needing to think about their leadership and their responsibility to organizational design. So, um, a little bit about me. Um, I, I started coding in about 1990. I'm, I'm old, been around for ages. Um, in about 2004 or five, I, I got my first management role. And, um, and ever since then, I've been kind of doing generally larger and larger management roles, um, mostly within the tech groups of big organizations. Um, and I'll talk a little bit about those in a sec. Um, I'm also uh, an InfoQ editor, um, mostly on culture and methods. And I'm an accreditor for IC Agile. Um, and um, the last couple of years, um, I founded a small consultancy called The Adjacent with a, a couple of other people. And um, our goal was really to try and help organizations be as awesome as they could be, and hopefully be awesome places for for human beings to to live in and and be creative. And and that was. Um, I guess, influenced by our upbringing in organizations and, and my upbringing in organizations when I was a developer was um, I was a very unhappy person and I swore that I would dedicate my life to making it better for others when I finally got hold of some reins. Um, and so, that, so that's what the last 15 years has um, become and that's what this model has been evolved from. Um, so the quick agenda is um, to go through the background of how I got to this, what evidence got collected, and I'm just going to try and run through the kinds of things that got collected together into the model, talk about the model, um, talk about acting in complexity and how to use the model in complexity, um, and the kind of study, plan, do, or build, measure, learn, or PDCA lifecycle, the diagnostics, the prioritizing, and the designing of iter iterations or interventions using the model. And hopefully, um, you'll all be... Um, uh, thinking many, many novel thoughts about how you're going to go back and start being organizational designers at the end of this. Uh, so my, a little bit of the history is starting when I first got my first managerial position and swore to do something different. I got the chance to actually invent process um, for a brand new development group at the Ministry of Social Development in New Zealand. Um, and I found someone who was um, a great um, agile coach and it was my first introduction to agile and I got really excited and I grabbed scrum and I grabbed feature driven development by Jeff DeLuca, if you know that, and designed all of the architecture and development stuff um, around those models and was really excited about finding all of this great new ways of running our organization. But I kept suddenly hit a bunch of boundaries and the boundaries were on either side of my teams. They were um, where... The testing was or they were where the uh, interaction with our customers was or wasn't um, or they were restrictions of the way that our finance department handled our teams and so I suddenly I had my first um, I guess experience of the boundaries of organizational design in, in a small space and so when I um, moved to the Met service um, suddenly I went oh I can push it further I can learn more and I and I suddenly started getting into that testing area and I brought in some Kanban and I started dealing with feature squads which involved um, many more of the roles and I started thinking about flow and I went great I've solved it all but no I bumped into infrastructure and I suddenly bumped into um, the project management group who really didn't like what I was doing. And, and so I kind of went, oh, damn, okay, I'll, I'll get it right in the next organization. And I moved to the Bank of New Zealand. And there I 
ran an even bigger team. And there I was able to get hold of infrastructure and I was able to put in some DevOps and I was able to think about multiple teams interacting with each other and bring in some of the early days of SAFE, actually. I, I bumped into Dean Leffingwell as he, as he was creating SAFE. Um, and I also managed to think about recruitment and culture and bring in some Kinevin and some complexity and, and, and did a course with Dave Snowden back in those days. Um, and the, I guess the story here is that every time I went into these, one of these places, I thought I had it all sussed. I thought I gathered everything together, but actually I hit boundaries on the outside again and I hit more pieces of the organization, which really mattered for us being as agile as we could be or as good as we could be, as awesome as we could be. Um, and so... Um, Recently, um, I, I was at Akado and uh, at Akado Technology, I was head of organizational effectiveness and I was able to add a whole bunch of HR change to that process and a whole bunch of portfolio management, and a whole bunch of forecasting. But I was never getting to the end of the game, but it had gave me some realizations. And the realizations were, it's not about agility. Agility is not the goal at the end of the game. The goal at the end of the game was it's about great organizations. It's about amazing places to work and it's about getting the, the whole working together. And it also made me realize it's not about any of these practices. Every time I picked up a new practice, I picked up the Kanban or the FDD or the TDD or the BDD or the, um, or the neat agile people techniques. Um, it, that didn't solve the problems that I was hitting trying to create a great organization. It almost always came down to the leadership and the systems and the friction and the alignment of all of those pieces together as one big complex operating system. And that what got me obs obsessed, I guess, about organizational design as a whole. Um, and so I started trying to catalog everything that I'd learned. I started trying to gather it all together and help others realize all of the stuff um, and particularly the leaders that I was trying to commu communicate with, say the C-level or the head of, head of digital or head of retail at a bank. Um, and I really wanted to also avoid the hearsay and the kind of things that people were um, throwing out there that really didn't have evidence behind it. So I really wanted to filter for stuff that I felt had good science behind it, had clear principles and things that we could take and reuse across the world rather than just in one organization where it happened to work. Um, and so I started to create this data lake. And, um, and this is a photo from about two or three years ago that I keep on reusing. It's, it's tripled in size now and it, it looks even worse. And this was kind of the key problem was it was too much information. And all of the leaders that I put this in front of pretty much ran away and hid in the corner and um, didn't want to talk to me about um, learning everything that's in this diagram. And you can imagine that's kind of obvious. So I had to change tactics and I had to actually put a model in front of them, something that was going to create access to all of this information, make it simple, give people the ability to sense make with it and use it in a really practical way, diagnostically, prioritization, designing different um, improvements for their organization, all of those kind of things. Um, and my caveat, all models are wrong, some are useful, I know mine is still a work in progress, but it has had a lot of use. And I do think it is now proving itself to be useful and it's been used for diagnostics and prioritization in international governments and in startups and in um, large organizations. So it's, it's pretty much seems to have been working as a model in, in many places over the last 10 years now. Um, and so, so let's jump into it. And the first part about the model is we have to um, take all of the ology items in that bottom layer. So psychology, sociology, anthropology, um, all of the maths, queuing theory, um, the complexity theory, and all of that kind of stuff. And we have to lock that down and say, that's our, that's our, our axioms, our kind of root science. And then we, uh, and then the other thing that I was collecting was a huge amount of practices and frameworks, which was everything from like Wardley mapping and zone to win and three horizons or hackathons or FDD and TDD and all of those kind of things. Um, but those were often uh, bits of thought leadership. And what we needed to do was connect where those things applied uh, to our organizations and what ologies they were based upon, which ones had real evidence behind them and which ones could we use in what kind of situations. And so I had to create this organizational dynamics layer of where these two elements met. And, and when I started staring at that big map of information, I basically got 
um, this model of nine boxes. And I'm going to explain a little bit what that's made up of in a moment. But basically, that um, we have commitments, we have the pillars of the organization, the outcomes we're after, and then we have the things that influence that. And I'll take us through that. So commitments is kind of obvious. It's purpose, mission, and vision. And we have to decide what direction our organization has to go into and where we want it to be awesome, what we want it to be awesome at. That's kind of a, a well-hammered um, point. What I was really interested in was what was happening under that. And so there were these three emergent pillars and I kind of vaguely circled them there. But the first one was we have to look at the organization and culture. We have to build the right team. We have to structure the hu our humans, our society, our community together in our tribes. And we have to make sure that they're as the most amazing tribes that they could be. Um, and here you can see there's some psychology books and some teaming books and there's some leadership books and all that kind of thing as well in there. Um, and we've also got all of the wonderful books like Reinventing Organizations and Fifth Discipline and Resilient Organizations and other such things to help us really look at the way we actually structure that team and all of that organization and culture. And that was a really big area that stood out like a sore thumb from, from my mapping. Um, and that gave us this pillar. The second pillar that was really obvious was we had to decide what to build. We had to build the right thing. And this is classic agile meme that we've all been probably listening to for years now. Um, and in this area, we got met um, Don Reinertsen's work and we got Creativity Inc. and we got service design and, and all of the stuff on how do we be user-centered? How do we listen to the people that we're designing for? And then how do we prioritize and and um, interact with those people to, to really understand how our product can meet their needs. Uh, and that gave us the second pillar. And the third pillar, um, fairly obviously, um, is build it right. So if we've, um, so now we're looking at efficiency and quality and we're looking at flow, we're looking at um, uh, clean code, we're looking at um, the Phoenix project, I guess, um, and forecasting and estimation and, and all the things that make us quicker at doing the thing that we need to be doing. And that gave us our third um, pillar. So there's the three pillars in the model, kind of obvious, but, um, but really important. And we'll talk about the importance of the order of those things as we go on. And then I've, what I realized was that there was a lot of literature showing up um, about ways to influence these things. And they happened at three distinct layers. One was forms of leadership, and that was, what are the principles and paradigms and strategy? And are our leaders walking the walk and talking the, or talking the talk and walking the walk um, to make all of the things in our organization and culture come together to pick paradigms for our products and services and tell us the vision and where we should go and who we're actually meant to be building for and to actually take a stance on efficiency and quality and make sure that the organization understood those. So we had this leadership role in setting the direction of the organization in all of those pillars. And, and there were lots and lots of decisions for leaders to make in all of those pillars. Secondly, the leaders then um, were constructing systems um, and or they were letting systems be constructed um, and sometimes very ad hoc, but these things generally needed to align. And the systems were the policies, the constraints, the standards, the tools, often held by HR, held by legal, held by risk. And finally, there was the daily actions and interactions of the people in the organization, the practices that were influencing in each of these three pillars. And so we had three levers that were the key influences to how these pillars were interacting and, and working together. Um, so now we have nine dynamics. When we sit them all across each other, we get nine places we can go in and look at an organization and we can figure out whether or not each of these nine boxes is actually working for this organization or whether there's pieces that are maybe some substandard or that we could progress or, and we can start to use that to think about where we should invest. Um, but before I jump into that, how to uh, invest, I thought I'd just cover some of the other things that are in that mapping on the left-hand side there. And some of the things that we should all be thinking about as organizational designers and maybe key interventions that would sit in one of those nine boxes. And I'll describe how we would find out where but um, so some of the things I discovered was that there's all sorts of different organizational models. I'm certain that most people here have heard of um, Frederick Lelou's book, Reinventing Organizations, and heard about TL organizations and the like. I'm sure also almost everyone here has heard about holacracy and sociocracy and all of these kind of things. The key here is that 
if we are going to make a commitment to one of those organizational models, that's clearly going to have an effect on the way we can run all of the other elements in the organization. And the organizational model is only one of the nine boxes. So if we pick one of these, it's suddenly going to have a flow on effect to the others. And we can talk about that in the, as we go forward. We're also probably going to end up needing to pick our organizational portfolio lifecycle. Are we going to have a pioneer settler town planner model a la um, Wadley mapping? Are we going to have a three horizons model inside our organization? Are we going to manage the evolution of our products with zone to win from Jeffrey Moore? And picking the paradigm or the, the bit of the framework or thought leadership that we're going to follow is again going to be effectively an organizational system that's going to have a flow on effect and affect all of the other nine boxes. Um, we're also going to need to start picking our, ad, our HR model, our finance model, our prioritization model, and, and the, the list of systems that we start finding in the boxes goes on and on and on. And the key is if we pick ones that are uh, contrary to each other, we're just going to create friction throughout our organization. And if we pick ones that are aligned with each other, then we're going to hopefully have a great life. Um, Obviously, we're going to be wanting to look at our efficiency model um, and how do we determine whether our value stream is efficient? Are we going to be um, old school utilization efficiency? Are we going to be flow efficiency and use theory of constraints? Do we believe in Little's law and queuing theory in our organization? And most leaders I ask those kind of questions, they don't even know what I'm talking about, which means that the paradigm is totally up for grabs and out in the air or being a point of friction across the organization as different bits of the organization do things that are misaligned or aligned with one of these things. Um, and clearly this also goes into organizational measuring um, and you guys will know these kind of bits and pieces. Um, it clearly goes into how do we orient our teams and our structure in our organization? Are we gonna be functionally structured, product structured, service structured? And one of the ones I'm seeing starting to be talked about a lot now is customer structured or persona structured. And actually we experimented in my very early days and about 10 years ago in the Bank of New Zealand with this, um, where actually we don't want to create one banking app and we don't want to put a team that creates the, the iPhone app and be functionally or product structured in that sense. What we want is a team that creates all the apps for uh, students. And we want a team that creates all of the apps for retired um, people so that people are getting the particular services they need for their walk of life. And that's more of that customer and persona structuring rather than product structuring. Um, and obviously we want to be able to look at all of the stuff around how, how well are we making a, a great environment for our people? Do we understand the psychology and sociology of our people? And there's an infinite library of stuff in this area. Now it's become hugely popular. Um, and it goes on and on and on. I'm going to skip forward. Um, one of the places you can go to actually um, see a little bit of this, and it's a, a little bit of a shameless plug, but um, InfoQ does um, really good uh, crossing the chasm maps of um, recent practices and models and frameworks and what are in innovation, what are early adopters and what are late majority. And so you can have a look at stuff that's coming in different areas and, and that's really useful particularly if you're in the software space um, and and this is just a spam of 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 many many practices and frameworks that are that i've um picked up but there are many more and I, if I'd, I'd have made the screen totally unreadable if i'd put them all up there and and that's the burden we're taking on as organizational designers which is why i needed to simplify it a little bit um, but while I'd been kind of helping people start to get their head around my model and see that all this stuff was out there, I'd noticed there was a bunch of really core bad habits going on in our leadership of our organizations. And when I say leadership again, I don't mean just management. Um, and the first one, which I hope I've just given you enough evidence to realize it shouldn't be the case, is that people were picking things that weren't evidence-based. And they were picking things that they just felt happy with or happened to be the thing that their manager had last used with them or had taught them or a friend down the road mentioned there was this neat thing. Um, and we weren't really checking whether or not we were picking things that really had great backing, had good proof, or had been used in more than one place and shown to be contextualizable to our organization. And um, so part of my campaign is to, to get us to really consider when we're picking up things, is it something that 
was appropriate and designed for someone else's organization and is not going to be appropriate to yours? And does it have any science behind it? Is it actually something that anyone has verified is actually going to give you a win? And the, then there were these, uh, and then we're going to move into these next kind of three areas or next design bad habits and, and talk about how we can use the model to overcome them. But one was people focusing on just their silo. And it's unfortunately natural and it's really easy to sort of put those boundaries up just like I was doing in my, my history where we, where I don't look outside of my team and I go, Oh, I'm not going to worry about past this boundary here. And I'm not going to worry about past this boundary here. But if we do that, if we keep putting our heads down and only thinking about our team and not worrying about our impact on the people next door and helping them understand their impact on us, then we're never going to see the whole properly. And we're never going to pick the right kind of organizational design. Secondly, we need to realize that no matter what we do, when we're dealing with organizations, we are dealing with complexity. We are dealing with human beings, which are by their nature, non-deterministic and unpredictable. And we can't just assume the answer will be simple and that there will only be one answer and that there will be a best practice. There is never a best practice in this kind of environment. And we must always constantly hunt and constantly contextualize what we're doing and accelerate and dampen. And we, um, hopefully you're all very conversant with Kinevin because um, I'm not going to go into it. But if you aren't conversant with Kinevin, please go and look it up after this talk. It's more important than what I'm telling you. Um, and um, and the last bad habit that I was seeing was people acting in low value places. What we were often doing is spending a lot of time worrying about how is the stand up going? How are us is our story breakdown going and not worrying about uh, things that are far more important to the effect of effectiveness of a team. Maybe just the interaction in the team, the collaboration and the feedback mechanism in the team or whether or not we are as a team affecting the whole organization by our behaviors. So we need to stop choosing interventions to do as agile coaches or as leaders in our organization where it's not really a valuable thing to do. It might just be an easy thing to do or a safe thing to do. And so now we're going to talk about how we, how we do design our lives in this huge area of complexity and the best words I could find to describe it is that we need to think about coherent evolution. We need to think about incremental evolutionary change towards a goal and aligned with all the other parts that are on that journey. Um, but what I'm generally seeing is these two models, which are the bad ways to deal with complexity. And the first one on the left is we're reacting to symptoms. We see a team uh, that's getting really, really unhappy in its sprint planning and having huge debates about estimation. Um, and so we want to go and fix that. Or, and we're, we're um, focusing on, on whether or not someone's got the right whip limit, or we're worrying about um, whether or not uh, the product owner um, happens to know how to use a backlog correctly. And we're often doing these kind of fragmented responses scattered across our organization in little ways and little teams. And what happens is if we then spend a whole bunch of time as a coach or as a scrum master or as a, a, an influencer in a team trying to help them get better on this thing, but actually there's a system sitting just above us. There's a, an HR policy or a finance policy or the, uh, a more senior leader influencing down on us. And we walk away and we go and help another team with a symptom. And then we look back and, oh, it's gone back to exactly the way it was. And we end up in an infinite game of whack-a-mole running around trying to stop all of the symptoms from coming up. Um, and the second way that I see um, organizations operating is we get the CEO or the CTO going, hey, we're all going to go safe. We're all going to go digital or we're all going to go agile. And they pick a cookie cutter, big pattern model, which has never been contextualized to their organization as a one size fits all and slap it down on top of their organization. And these kinds of things, by definition, cannot work in a complex world. Um, and yet this seems to be one of the most popular models at the moment. So the reason it doesn't make sense and is when we start thinking about complexity and we realize we have to use systems thinking and that there are so many interacting layers, it's, it's crazy. 
uh, I, hopefully many of you have read the book Behave by Robert Sapolsky, and he just is just talking about the inherent complexity in a single one of us, in a single human being, and that if we want to influence a single human being, we need to worry about neuroscience and hormones and psychology and culture and all these things on this list. And that's just a starter. But our organizations are much more complex than that. They are a, a, a ball of rubber bands and many, many systems and interacting um, patterns and practices and hundreds or thousands of people in many cases. And if we decide, oh, I just want to straighten that pink rubber band, then I'm instantly going to have these unintended flow on, flow on effects and suddenly a purple rubber band will change or a blue rubber band will change. Or if I take two points on outside of that uh, network diagram and I grab one node on one fire edge and a node on the other fire edge and I pull them or I keep on adjusting them until they're all the connections between those two points is absolutely straight and I have a perfect value stream through my organization, I'm instantly going to put many other nodes in that network out of place. And so the key here is that every time I interfere with a network like this, I'm going to have to accelerate and dampen what I just did because it's going to have the unintended consequences. It's going to be the ripples of the stone thrown into the pool. And, and in those cases, we can't use a cookie cutter pattern and we can't play whack-a-mole. We will never get there. Um, so I'm just going to say, I hope you know Kinevan. We all must know Kinevan as a way to contextualize this for ourselves and for other people. But generally, it's the idea that we must realize we're working in this complex domain and we need some form of probe sense respond to actually interact in this complexity. And then we can get you can actually go on a journey. It's the classic um, um, shifting arrow um, or zigzagging um, item to the target um, that we all see. But basically, there's pulling external complexities and pulling internal complexities. And every time we do an intervention, we don't really know where we're going to end up next. So we have to be able to do another diagnostic question where we're at and see if we can reorganize towards our awesome organization again. Um, and, and, and there's many, many of these kind of learning cycles, feedback cycles that we talk about in the agile world. And you can kind of pick your one. It doesn't matter as long as you are um, using some form of learning loop and, and, and making sure that you are checking where you're at. So, so if we're going to check where we're at, then we need a diagnostic. We need to be able to see the whole and actually know where we are on that journey to an awesome organization. So um, what I did was in each of the boxes on the nine boxes that we've just been talking about in the model, um, I wrote a whole set of questions. And there's now about 120 questions in the whole set. And they were based upon key topics that kept on coming up time and time again in the literature and the academic literature and the articles and the books. And by having all of these questions, what we could do is we could go out and um, diagnose a box and give it a rating in our organization. And we could narrow that down to having effectively nine uh, rated boxes. And for each box, we could write, a, I wrote a, a bit of a rubric. Um, and well, actually for each question, we're writing rubrics. And, um, and so our team now has rubrics for many, many different boxes and many, many, many different questions. And that lets us go, hey, we're right at the excellent end on um, the, the top left box, and, but we're really we're nowhere on the, on the bottom right box. And we can then actually do some diagnostics to go, oh, we're on the right journey or we're not. It's gone green, it's gone orange, it's gone yellow. And we'll actually know something about that. And we want to do that by going out into our organization and walking the floor doing a Gemba, classic lean and agile thinking. Um, and we want to take as much, do, a, do it with a sense-making model if we can, a la um, Dave Snowden. And we want to make sure that we kind of um, then summarize what's, what's in each box and then we can kind of rate them all. And so we can get a, a map of our organization that maybe looks like this. Um, but just by having these red boxes and this green box and yellow boxes, it still doesn't ask, um, explain exactly where we should target, but at least now we've had our probe. We've done our probe. We've done our study, if you will. Yeah. So the, and um, this actually was um, an example of one I did um, a few years back, and this was an earlier version of the model. And you can see there's actually 12 boxes and not nine boxes, and that proved too complicated. So we removed a few. Um, uh, but what you could see was when we went out and did the Gemba in this organization and we collected lots and lots of stories about what was going on in, in this organization, 
almost all of the stories of concern and worry and places where people wanted us to act as a change agent in the organization was on the left side in the people column. And you can see that there's very, very few in the efficiency column and the quality column on the right hand side there. And so now we've got something that we can put in front of the leadership and say, look at all of the sense making stories that came back and look at they're all clustered on the left. Maybe we should do something about HR or maybe we should do something about clarity or vision or culture. And, and we'd get an indication from what those things are. So, but now we had to choose which one of those many, many things on that list or the, of the, what does the evidence tell us in each box and where should we prioritize and where should we go? And clearly when we're dealing in complexity, there's this concept of equifinality and that there are many, many paths to the same outcome. So exactly what we do and exactly where we do it um, is, is, is kind of up to us. And we want to work with the leaders to discuss where's the right place at the moment. Where can you afford to spend some time? How much budget can you afford to spend on an innovation? Can we disturb everyone at the moment if we want to do a change on a thousand people? Or can we only have 10 to do some kind of experiment change? And, and we need to ask those kind of questions. Um, so there's, there's going to be no right answer, but at least we can think about where we're going to go next. And when we started looking at trying to prioritize between all of these boxes. Should we amplify the green box or should we try and dampen the, the bad stuff that's going on in the red boxes? What we found was that there was an implicit ordering in the model. So leadership, as we talked about before, sets the systems in an organization and the systems um, create the constraints and the boundaries within which practices evolve. So actually practices don't dictate systems and systems don't dictate leadership. It's the other way around. Yeah. So we go that way. And that means that if we do something in the leadership space, it has a wide flow on effect throughout the organization. And we'll talk about that in a sec. The other one was that just like there's no point in focusing on efficiency and quality of the wrong product. So there's no point in building the wrong thing, right? Um, we also found that if we don't have the right team and the right people, it almost didn't matter if we had the right product. We had to have the right group of people with the right skills and the right temperament and attitudes and understanding the, and the right culture to actually go out and evolve a product and make it a success in a marketplace. And then we could worry about how fast and how much quality and how, effect, uh, how cost effective we could make that product. So, so there's this implicit ordering of our pillars as well. And that gives us this rough ordering for the whole model. And, and that means we can say that actually the bottom right hand corner is the lowest place, lowest priority place to act. If we have um, change initiatives we were thinking about in that box and the highest pro priority place to act is in the top left hand corner with our leadership of the organization and culture, if that has got problems. And it's roughly a heat map like this top left, the most uh, important place to act and then kind of fading as you go out towards the right. Um, but what we find when we look at organizations is that they tend to um, hit a couple of conundrums when dealing with this. The um, organizations tend to focus on efficiency and practice. And we were wondering why. And we, the reason why is because the it's easy it's often easy to see it's often shows up in the symptom directly in the front of our face it's often mechanistic and it's often quick to make changes there um, because it doesn't involve shifting human paradigms moving people around changing their roles changing the way they're assessed all of the kind of really hard stuff over on the left but the downside is that it often is only symptomatic and not causal and often stuff we find on the right hand column is caused because of stuff further left or further up. And, and so often if we stop putting energy into a change in the efficiency column, then it eventually gets overridden by the culture of the organization and goes back to where we originally saw it when we first walked in. Um, so organizations really should be focusing on the leadership and organizational column, but um, and the upsides there is that if they do work there, it has huge flow on effect into the organization. It has great power and it makes long lasting change. But the downside is it's scary and it involves 
a lot of people's livelihoods and a lot of people's paradigms and egos. And so often people avoid it because it's hard and scary. So let's look at a few tangible examples of using this prioritization and let, let's map story points. Um, and I guess uh, it, the reason I'm mapping story points is because it seems like we spend about 50% of all internet time talking about um, story talk points and estimation in the agile movement. Um, and, and unfortunately for me, it's in the lowest priority box on the board. So why are we spending 50% of our time talking about it? when it really doesn't have much major effect in our organizations. And it's because I think, because it's, it's kind of easy to get wrapped up in that conversation rather than the harder conversations, or we don't feel empowered to affect the other places on the board. Um, but it's, it's clearly um, an efficiency model. It's a, it's, it's, it, and it's a localized practice. So unless everyone's being forced to use uh, story points by a system imposed by say the PMO or something. Um, it, let's map Scrum and Scrum um, we find actually sits when we map out all of the different things in the Scrum guide, it pretty much sits in this bottom right hand corner as well. And that doesn't make it a wrong thing to do. In fact, it can be a really great thing to do in those bottom quadrants. But if it is not aligned with other systems in the organization or the leadership of the organization, then it's instantly going to start creating friction with those higher and further up and left boxes. And that's going to mean, I don't know if about you guys, but, but I've seen a lot of Scrum implementations fail because people eventually get into those friction points. They create lots of friction. They make lots of people around them grumpy. And now everyone says horrible things about Scrum um, or Agile or whatever the flavor that we've put in place if we've just imposed it in the bottom right-hand corner and we focus on just like a tech team and some of their practices. So we really have to think about when we're going to put some of these things in how is this going to align and how are we going to make sure it's not a friction point with all those upper boxes or it will lose? Um, another classic I'm seeing is test automation. We want to do a whole bunch of test automation. We, we um, decide to go and get our developers to start writing automated tests, but actually there's a system and the system says that we're going to assess um, whether or not um, we should get more developers and the efficiency of our tech unit based upon how much time we can prove our developers are spending on coding. And, and there's like a time sheeting system that says, um, it, or a thing in JIRA which says, put your time to coding or testing in, in JIRA as a task. And, and the PMO come in and they go, hey, hoy, you guys are spending way too much time on testing. You're not, you're not, keeping our dev utilization really high. And we think that's the way that we get productivity. And we get this collision between a test practice we want to bring in and a system that's been imposed um, on the efficiency of the organization, which, um, which isn't aligned. Or maybe we have a delivery date come up and the sales team or the head of product has promised a delivery date and therefore it's a leadership um, action and it's happening in the product and service column in the top middle there and we go oh no no we've, we've still got a whole bunch of test automation to make sure it's 100 percent quality um which do you think is going to win the head of product and, the, and their delivery date or the test automation in the bottom right hand corner so we all see that basically anything further up and left is going to have overall i guess design win or is eventually going to override the stuff further down and left um other great ones we get uh, let's let's say we get a sales incentive model. And the sales incentive model says, let's sell lots more things. Now, a sales incentive model is an incentives, which means it's probably an HR or performance management measure. It's probably a system. And if it's looking up, it's, if it's performance management and, and looking at people's livelihoods, like the salespeople, it's in the organization and culture column. It's a human uh, dynamic about that slice, that pillar. Um, and then we suddenly go and tell everyone as agile coaches, let's limit our work. And so now we have just instituted a practice on our teams, which is um, going to compete with an incentive model, at, at, which is a system in the left-hand column. And it, which is going to lose, right? It, obviously, the teams limiting work are going to get told to pull their head in, or we're going to end up with a massive friction line in the middle there. And the same often happens with UX and UR. We want to be do amazing user research. We want to do amazing UX designs. And we keep on saying, um, we're going to do um, 
we, we haven't finished yet. We've got to do the best job here. And the sales guys are going, no, no, it's sold. Sorry, it's, it's going to, they're going to win because it's their incentive model. Um, so, and the, la the last one I'm going to mention at the moment, which I'm seeing all the time at the moment, is conflict between OKRs and weighted shortest job first. So um, often organizations are bringing in OKRs. OKRs act like an organization or human system in that they are a form of performance management. People are assessed against them. Um, and they are choosing whether to do actions um, in, with their day-to-day -day time based upon their OKRs. But then we have a product prioritization chain. And if we're doing great lean or maybe we're doing safe or something, then we're using weighted shortest job first to order our backlogs. And we know what the first thing we should be taking off our backlog, but it, com it conflicts with an OKR that I've got. Now I'm a developer and I'm choosing between my OKR and the first thing off the list. And suddenly we get developers disappearing um, and not quite being as efficient as they were. And you ask them what they were doing yesterday. And, um, oh, I was just doing this other thing. Don't worry about it. And they were focusing on their OKRs. And we've got this conflict and this friction in their, in their minds as to whether or not they finish off an OKR or whether they work on the next item on the backlog. And um, obviously, if you implement OKRs, cleverly and contextualized for your organization, you can avoid this, but you need to make sure that you aren't creating two systems that are in conflict and friction with each other. So now we, we know the priority places we might want to intervene, um, but we still need to design an intervention. And obviously when we're designing an intervention in complexity, we have equifinality. There's many ways of getting to this, to a design, uh, um, to a, an outcome that we're after. And we have the multi-finality problem, which is when we throw the rock in the pool, we're not actually sure where it's going to go and we're not going to be sure what outcomes we're going to get. So we need to be ready to accelerate and dampen. And clearly this is um, seems to be far too hard for many people in organizations to get and that we, we seem to, to promise and guarantee that we're going to be able to deliver everything absolutely perfectly every time. But if we think about this as the classic, um, I'm gonna, I've got some knee pain, what am I gonna do about it? If we were gonna get some help on that as a leader or as a, an influencer, we would clearly not go, oh, it's okay, I know what it is. I, um, I just need to go and, um, I don't know, take a hammer and knock my kneecap a few times and it'll be okay. We're going to want to get some expert help on this. We're going to want to make sure that we go and see maybe a surgeon, maybe a personal trainer, maybe an osteopath. We're going to want to check whether, get them to check with their expert knowledge, whether it's our glutes or our IT band or whether it really is our kneecap that we need to, need to give a thump. Um, and we're going to have to then figure out all the different ways in which we could um, work on this problem. We're probably going to gather as many of those specialists as we can afford together with us and go, well, should I be changing my workout routine? Should I be stretching? Should I be going and seeing a GP? Um, or should I be going and seeing a surgeon and, and all those kind of things? And, but we're also gonna contextualize that intervention based upon the environment that, that we find ourselves in. Um, are we a long-term runner? Are we, um, are we 50 or are we 15? Um, are, do we tend to stick to our goals when we pick them up and, and all these kind of other things? So we have to make sure we treat any intervention that we do in our organization with the same kind of rigor that we would do with this. We need to gather that group of specialists around and make sure that we're considering the environment and considering all the possible ways that we can intervene. Um, and, and unfortunately, there's no right answer, but we should really be checking whether or not the thing that we're choosing is next adjacent or and coherent for the situation that we're in. There is no point taking a rubric like in this thing on the right where we have a, a red element or a very low maturity end of the rubric and a very high maturity end of the rubric. So we have a, a very um, red, specifically red, and if we talk Frédéric Laloux, um, organization doing very functionally focused waterfall um, model. And we say, oh, it's okay. We're going to shift you to scaled agile and we're going to jump you from one end of the rubric to the other. That's definitely not next adjacent for this organization. It's going to be far too much of a leap and it's probably going to fail unless they're willing to like maybe ING turf their entire organization in the air and let it fall back together again. 
And that's, that's a pretty big bet that you're going to be making there. And we're probably not going to leap an organization from highly hierarchical to a learning organization all in one loop. So we have to figure out what's, what's actually got, what would actually take us from red to orange? What's the next possible for that organization? What's the next adjacent and what's coherent for that organization? So maybe if we're trying to improve efficiency, first we'd see if we can find a value stream and, and maybe pick one element of that value stream and see if we can do some modification on it. Or maybe we'd first go and see if we could help our organization learn about flow efficiency and then um, see if we can spot one value stream and maybe try limiting WIP in that one small element of our organization. And this is just the classic, we must do small experiments, but we make sh must make sure that they are next adjacent for those, those teams or those organizations and coherent for those teams and organizations. Um, and that means potentially getting HR finance and the BMO on side if you're doing a very small leap. Um, so a, a quick example of, of some systems thinking in action, which I've seen recently, and, and this is almost a real example, um, is we had an organizational leader who really wants more innovation in their organization. And they're going, but they... And they have a fundamental paradigm or principle in their head that money motivates creativity. So, and rather than actually doing a systems model of this and actually thinking about the impacts and whether or not their knee is really hurting, they were convinced that this was the truth. And so they invented, hey, we'll have an innovation competition and we'll offer a 5,000 pound prize um, and and, and we'll do that annually. And, and of course, everyone will give us all the greatest ideas for our organization and we'll get way, way more innovation in our organization. But what actually happens is that we start up this innovation competition and that makes people want to save their ideas. So suddenly everyone's hoarding their ideas and they're waiting for the next innovation competition in a year's time. And so the focus on creativity in the teams starts to drop and the amount of daily innovation starts to drop. And so the leader goes, oh heck, um, why, why are we getting less ideas coming into our organization? And so they go, oh, I know what we'll do. We'll, we'll make the reward bigger so that the annual competition is even better. And, and so people save even more of their ideas and, and, and it goes on and on and on. And I don't know um, how many of you, if I show you, have used, um, a little uh, causal loop diagram like this or a bit of systems mapping like this. Um, but there's a nice little tool out here, which is why I did this um, in, can you see that Gordon? Is that, and if I press play on that and say, we want a bit of innovation and this little tool lets you go, oh, what will happen if I, if I draw this diagram out and start firing some, some effects into it and then, and you get this nice little thing that goes, oh, actually, that's going to mean that I'm going to maximize saving ideas and bigger rewards, and I'm going to minimize focus on creativity and daily innovation. Um, and obviously, that's a very, very simplistic diagram, but it's a fun little tool to play with and go, oh, maybe actually the thing I'm going to do in my system is a really bad idea. Um, so I'll stop that and pump back over there. Um, but so I, I highly recommend everyone has a play with some causal loop mapping or just try and draw out your any ideas for any intervention you're going to do and make sure that it actually makes sense and that you've thought about all of the possible interactions. So how can I use the model for that? Well, here's one of the questions is what might I do in that innovation? How many different ways might I interact if I tried to put an intervention in any one of the boxes on the model? So maybe we go, oh, what might give us more in innovation? Well, how about we start focusing our organization on growth mindset? How about we um, make one of our values for our culture learning? And if, our, if we make culture learning, that's top left-hand corner. That's the leadership changing the values of the organization, setting a new culture direction. And that arrow would point there. Maybe we go, um, actually, we've discovered that um, innovation is transient and it happens in these moments and it's a serendipity and we want to capture it when we, when we see it. So maybe we make our finance model, which is a, an organizational system box in the left-hand side there. Let's make that 
let's make access to innovation finance much easier. So the moment someone comes up with an idea, they'll run off to the finance department and say, or to their manager and say, hey, can I get some of that innovation funding? And can I act, turn my idea into reality right now? Or maybe we realize that diversity supports creativity. So we should do an intervention in the left-hand culture box again, and we should do recruitment, which is HR, which is the left-hand organizational column and the system level, and we'll change our recruitment model to look for more diversity, and our team composition will get better, and hopefully we'll get more innovation that way. Or maybe we've read a bunch of academic literature, and we've discovered that uh, innovation is actually teachable. So maybe we can create a practice in our organization and culture column at the bottom corner, and we can actually start training people on how to, how to realize the innovation in their brains and utilize that muscle and be a bit more neuroplasticity in our organization. Um, and, and the list kind of goes on. We can think about where are many different places we could interact in this organization and which one's most possible for us. But we may avoid whip limits um, or worry as a as a mechanism because we know it's a practice and it's in the bottom hand column and it might not even though it should remove some overburden we know that if there are cultural biases on the left hand side they would override that and we possibly wouldn't have a great effect on innovation and this lets us contextualize where we're going to make our own you know, intervention in the organization for our design and and obviously you can get carried away with your um, your diagrams and you could go, well, what happens when people, most of the people in the organization don't win their an annual competition and then they get unhappy and then people leave and then our recruitment costs go up and, and you can start to then put these diagrams in front of hopefully other leaders and have a, a really good discussion about what's the best way to actually bring innovation into our organization, maybe rather than having an annual competition. Um, but again, the um, as kind of the winding down of my talk, there's no right answers with these interventions. What the model is get, allowing us to do is contextualize where should we intervene, diagnose what the state of each place we might intervene is, and consider the relative priority and whether or not things are going to override each other or whether or not we're going to um, create a non, a, a frictionless or a frictionable um, state. Um, and, and, and one of those classic situations might be um, that there's this constant trade-off that if we do want to improve innovation, we may have to sacrifice some optimization. If we do want to improve information, we may have to sacrifice some business as usual time or sacrifice some quality or sacrifice some sales right now. So, so there is, every time we pull a piece of the, uh, or pull one of the rubber bands, we're going to affect all of the others. Um, and, and kind of my last kind of, um, statement is a lot of this sounds very very high level and very very big and maybe stuff that a senior leader only has access to but what we find is that we can do these diagnostics on all nine boxes for even a single team or a very small startup and we see the same patterns emerging in all of those places and we can still do the same diagnostic um, it's just a lot quicker um, than doing it on a large organization or a government. Um, but we can then get information about how, where is our team being affected and where might there be systems that are affecting it from outside of the team boundaries. Um, so you can be on the lookout for dysfunction and use the same model, even on a very small team, no matter how big the area that you're influencing or leading is. Um, so, um, so as leaders, make sure that we are designing for our community, designing for our priorities and our customer needs, and also designing our structure and systems for quality and make sure all of those things fit together and that we act as organizational engineers and see the whole of what's happening and design for the whole. Um, so, so that's the end of my, uh, I guess, campaign uh, talk. Excellent. Thank you very much. Uh, Simon, I don't know if you kept an eye on any other questions. Simon? Yeah, thank ah, you. Excellent. Well, Sorry, you're back. Yeah, thanks. thanks very much. Yeah, we've got plenty of questions. Um, all I can say about Doug is this guy reads, right? I think you'd need, someone mentioned in the chat, you're going to need a couple of lifetimes. Just for, so thanks for doing the hard work for us, Doug. I appreciate it. It's really good. 
Okie doke. Uh, yeah, we have plenty of questions. Uh, Doug, I don't know whether it might be worth uh, keeping your slide shared because there are a couple of references to individual slides. Okay. And whilst I totally get that you probably know your slides, it might help um, fetch context for the rest of the viewers if they're able to see it. Absolutely. I'll happily pop them back up uh, if that's where we need to go. Superb. Right. Okay. So questions. I'm going to go from the top. See what we have. So the first one was from Roy. Roy said, I hear a lot about sense making. Can you give an example or two of where sense making has made a big difference? Um, so I guess I'm using the term kind of stealing from uh, Dave Snowden and Cognitive Edge. Um, many of you will know the Kinevin framework, the, um, the chaotic, uh, complex, complicated, simple model. But um, one of the key things that he brings to the to the party is that he's an anthropologist and and so what he talks about is when we want to diagnose something in an organization as complex as say culture or why are people acting the way they are acting and there are many many agents in that system that if we go and ask people directly um uh why aren't you being productive <laughs> obviously that's a very inflammatory version of it but but then Clearly, we're not going to get uh, good answers. We're going to get the biases that you'd expect when we ask those kind of questions. So then we need techniques from psychology. And I know, Roy, this is kind of an area for you and sociology and anthropology to get to ask obliquely and, and kind of sense make what's going on inside the system without affecting the system too much. It's kind of the if we prod too heavily then the system either pushes back or we affect the system so so it's about oblique diagnostics um and i think there are many many ways that that um probably psychologists and sociologists will know better far better than me how to do to get those oblique ways but what i've been using is the Kinevin idea of if we get people to tell us a story about life when it's good in their team or life when it's hard in their team or um, 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 when have you been proud of your work if we're trying to dig around quality or something like that and we ask these oblique questions then the stories we get back have got all the evidence we need in them and if we ask six or seven or ten or a hundred people across an organization to get a sample set we very quickly see patterns in the stories and we can categorize the stories against particular metrics that we might be looking for like uh leadership clarity or system effects or bad practices or whatever we're particularly trying to understand about the system does that make sense roy very much yeah very helpful thank you okay get thinking on those oblique questions to ask. So uh, a next one from Roy again, and Roy references slide 43. And he asks any significance to internal complexity and external complexity in separate circles. Uh, do you want me to bring the slide up uh, or should I just leave it? No, David's nodding away. Okay, I'll, <laughs> I'll bring, the, bring the slide up. Uh, but by the way, Simon, feel free to skip any of my questions. I don't want to do that. <laughs> Never. Never. <laughs> Roy got carried away, huh? Um, all good. Um, oh, no, it's down there. Okay. So, so yeah, what, what, we're, what we're seeing a lot today is uh, a juggling act in organizations and external complexity we're all familiar with. That's why we're on this remote event right now yeah external complexity happens to us it's very unpredictable um the world around us we thought was complex when we were just trying to figure out how do we make the best product for the market but suddenly it got well actually am i going to have people are they going to be in the same country are they going to be able to talk to each other are we going to even be able to have that service design workshop together um what tools can we so all of that external complexity is happening to us right um, and, and it's no longer just what do my customers want at the moment? It's where are my customers going to be? How are they even going to get to my business? And all of those kinds of questions have, have started, become a real reality for organizations, but it was always there. There was always a complexity there. It just hadn't hit so hard. 
And the internal complexity that everyone's fighting with is then you get a manager who's being pushed on one side by all of those questions. Where is their team? How do I, how do I get them to talk to each other? And then, oh, sorry, that's, that's internal complexity. And then they're getting these internal complexity ones, which is I've got 50 staff and they've all got different personalities and they've all got different skills. And I thought I could have them all sitting next to each other and collaborating and I can't now. Um, uh, what am I going to do um, to help productivity? What am I going to do to help communication? What am I going to do to help collaboration? What am I? And and all of the management issues and all of the environment issues and things that are internal to the way we're running our organization. Um, and and I find that most managers tend to have a a propensity to focus on one and not the other. Mm-hmm. And what we're trying to say is that you have to balance the two because they're both pulling you in crazy directions all the time. Got it. Thank you. And there's just a follow-up question. It's later on in the chat, but it relates to this slide from David who asks, where is chaos in slide 43? I guess that's referencing um, the Kenevian frame. Yeah, so, so, so I guess one of the things I'm arguing is that there's no simple here. Or if there is simple, it's irrelevant. Don't worry about it. We've done, we've sussed it. We've already figured it out. So so almost all the problems we're trying to work with here are complex. Um, there was a moment of chaos, I think, for us when we when some organisations had absolutely no plan, no conception of of the the fact that COVID w- was going to have the impact it did. But I think it very quickly became a complex problem, a very complex problem. But if you're dealing with the interactions of a a thousand people um, and um, many products in the marketplace, um, then then you're still not in chaos. It's it's still only a complex situation. It just happens to be a very, very large number of agents in your complex domain. Um, And... The same rules apply, I think. So I'm not sure chaos really is here, David. Does that make sense? And David follows up to say, our awesome organization recognizes the chaos and is comfortable dealing with it. I I think if we if we're finding ourselves in a situation where we just need to act um, too often then something's going wrong in our organization. Um, and and I think that now in Kinevin model, he has that kind of point of confusion in the center. I can't remember what he calls it. The liminal point, is it? What is it? Someone Euphoria? Might... Disorder? Euphoria? Euphoria, Euphoria. Yeah, that's the one. Thank you. Um, and, and in that spot where we're trying to determine which way we should go, I think we're finding ourselves much more in that place than we are in chaos. I think chaos is a very seldom event for a for a normal organization. All right, thank you. So next question was from Patricia who asks, I'm curious about how you apply your framework to acquisitions and mergers. In my experience leading several integrations, there you have at best two different cultures and leadership is swifting. So mention a couple only. Yeah, um, I, yeah, I, I've, I've been chatting with a, a, a senior leader about a, a, an acquisition situation just recently, and we were talking about the um, l- doing a nine boxes on both organizations and trying to find out where there were incompatible systems and incompatible leadership paradigms. Um, and the key was that we needed to be able to go through the classic paradigms in each of the boxes. And we're just using the boxes as a, as a guideline to help us go, have we had a quick look at this? Because we might miss one. And if we miss that box, suddenly um, we, we might have missed a really important point of friction between the two organizations. And then we have to go, okay, now we've got two organizations. Are they the same size? Has one got a power in the, in the, in the game? Um, and which one's going to have to give and we're going to have to look at change because if we try and maintain two totally separate cultures with totally separate systems we know we're going to have friction we know we're going to have a blow up so the key is then what's the next adjacent move on the grid where's the safest place to do that and what's the next experiment to prove that we can find something to fit that intervention Um, 
but but it was really useful to be able to go have we thought about all the possible things that might go wrong here and that was what we used the nine boxes for on each organization does that answer the question hopefully cool great okay next question so this is from david and uh, just correct me david if i don't read this uh, out correctly or get to your your meaning it's more of a comment that i guess it's it's one for discussion uh, and david says leadership greater than systems greater than practices doesn't appear to be very user sensitive maybe this is okay if the organization and culture is user orientated no practices will work without users I, I guess, David, is the, is the question there whether or not leadership and user centricity is represented in the leadership space? Yeah, yeah. The, and the next comment, the focus needs to rotate. Otherwise, the top left position asserts a hierarchy as before. And I, I'm sensitive to the, I understand the nine cells to me make complete sense. But if you don't rotate the focus, you're relying on the leadership to be enlightened so you know in a sense we're saying we, we have to have an enlightened uh, oligarchy dictatorship i'm not sure what what it is but by keeping the focus in one corner the we lose the agility that comes from examining different points of view and wow. in a way elevating the user's perspective is saying has the culture permeated to the level of practice you know have we achieved that and it's a way of measuring the vision and the enablement because there's two things. One is the buy-in and the other is the enablement. So without the systems to implement the vision, you're not going anywhere. That's all. Yeah, I, th I think you're saying many of the same things I'm saying is that in my model, we, we unfortunately, you're, you're absolutely right. The leadership does need to be enlightened because what we find is that if you have uh, leadership with particular paradigms and principles in their head that they are espousing either through their explicitly or implicitly that they will those things will appear in the systems that they allow to be created in their organization and then those systems will set the boundaries and constraints on the practices that can flourish and so it and what we find is that the power dynamic is always leadership first system second practice will practice losers so what we need to do is make sure that if we're going to get new practices which are amazing practices and user centricity and, and other um, such things then we have to figure out ways to influence the systems and the leadership for, to allow that to happen i i completely agree and the point i'm making is it's it's necessary to ritualize that input so that enlightened leadership recognizes that they need to hear from that level more frequently than they dictate to that level. Excellent stuff. Okay, so following on from that, checking through the questions, lots of comments, uh, Doug, on the talk. Uh, really awesome, very insightful, fabulous, fantastic. Um, so lots of appreciation for the talk. So thanks for, for sharing. Um, comment from David, what does good look like in the top left-hand leadership box? Um, it depends on the commitment of the organization is part of the answer. So remember above the nine boxes sits the commitment and vision and goal of the organization. And you could argue that if this is an organized crime syndicate, that the uh, that what good looks like for that leadership in the top left-hand corner is going to be very very different than uh, RSPCA. <laughs> yeah, so so I'm I wasn't trying to make a judgment in that box of what was good. I was trying to say that the key here is that the leadership. In fact, the the my version of good for the leadership in the top left-hand corner is that they have decided across all of the boxes what their paradigms are, what principles they are espousing, they are making them clear to the organization, and then they are walking the walk and talking the talk to, to really build those into their organization with systems and allow those practices to flourish. Yeah, If they do not have that, if they are not creating that alignment across the whole of the organization, then they will be a bad leadership. Whether or not they should be teal style leadership or red style leadership, I wasn't making a judgment on. So you mentioned 
uh, I think learning, learning and development as a as, as would up their game. Is that the the top one for you or? Um, I think growth mindset is the top one for me. Yeah. Okay. You know, which is learning basically, right? Yeah. It's, okay. Yeah. Sorry, that's what you said. Yeah. If they can't adapt, and they can't deal with complexity, which is shifting on them all the time, internal to their organization and external to their organization, then leading any organization is going to fail. It's going to eventually die. With dinosaur. So um, now, obviously, I have personal preferences because I set out to build an awesome organization where people loved to live and love to be and go to work. And therefore, obviously, I don't really, I wouldn't design my organization for red. But um, but I and I would design for a much more empowered growth mindset space. But um, thank you. All righty. Next question is from Liz, and Liz asks: It's clear that change at the leadership slash from the leadership level is key. You mentioned that we can be leaders for our team and apply this model at the team level. But what happens when we've got as good as we can be in the bottom right hand box and we want to influence change in the top left? Is it possible or do we need to find a better place to work? <laughs> it, 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 I think I've heard that question um, at every Agile conference I've been to in the last sort of 20 years. Um, and, and I think that both are possibilities and you have to make a judgment how bad the situation is um, in your organization and whether you can stay around to be part of the change or whether you need to move. But I do believe that we can be part of the change. And I have tried to be that mini umbrella as I grew through leadership layers in organizations in my career many times and I stuck with it. And I don't regret any of those attempts, even when they eventually um, were subsumed or overridden by CEOs or other such things. Because I know that I helped enlighten other members of our community and other people around us to join this movement um, by doing that, by sticking in there and, and going for what I thought was right. But my, my belief now is that the, one of the ways to help our leaders is we have to pick something that's next adjacent, not massive revolutionary leaps. And if we just suddenly run in to a waterfall organization and drop scrum on them, it will fail and it will piss people off. So my main call is make it next adjacent make it a small appropriate designed leap and then try and uh, draw some systems diagrams and show the effects and get some great measures around the, the little change that you were trying to make and show other people around you how they could take on that little change and see if you can expand the experiment and, and accelerate it into other teams near you and, uh, and talk to the leaders above about, hey, look at the neat thing we've achieved. But let's get away from large revolutionary places where we don't involve the interactions around us. Let's let's start making sure that we're creating next adjacent and coherent movements. That sounds incredibly significant. Though. Could you say that last sentence again? Let's get away from. I'm, I'm sorry, I, it was just coming out of me, but uh, so uh, you want to repeat it back, Roy? What was... He said, get away from agile transformation. I think that's <laughs> <laughs> There's something about the interaction, like, like rather than do this and the rest be damned, something about... The... Yeah, totally. So, so the, the key things for me is coherent evolution, which means looking for next adjacent shifts that are not going to create uh, in fact, uh, I guess, antibody reactions from the organization around us mm -hmm. and are going to be coherent and not too much friction for them to deal with and then tell our story mm -hmm. and show them that we can, we can make an improvement on something and, and have a measure for that, you know, and, and, and every intervention I now design, I'm looking for that. I'm not looking for a revolution where I replace an entire set of uh, people's lives with an entirely new set. Um, I think that occasionally organizations are brave enough to do that, but it has to be CEO and board from the top. Here you go, Roy, there's your tweet or your sound bite. 
<laughs> evolution to avoid organizational antibody reactions. Get it on TikTok. <laughs> All righty. So uh, this one's a comment from Chris who says, uh, law of requisite variety sprung to mind when thinking about internal versus external complexity. So what to think about there. I don't know if you've got any comments on that, Doug. Uh, no, I, I, he's absolutely right. And, and I guess the, the issue that, that we had when trying to put this model together was, um, you know, requisite variety is like one, one little piece of science that we can apply from a huge pile of science in that ev evidential collection that I was trying to demonstrate at the beginning. And, and the key is, um, like I said, with uh, you know, if you've got a knee problem, bring the experts around it um, because you probably don't know what you're going to know enough to do it yourself. Um, you need to gather a really diverse group of experts around anything you're going to do. Um, so, as a an agile coach or as a scrum master or as a an enterprise um, uh, change agent of some form, make sure that you don't try and design these interventions on your own that you get some diversity around so that you create the best solution you have access to. Okay, Shrilla asks, is it possible to find more information about this model and the best way to go about implementing it like you've mentioned? Uh, so the answer is I'm trying to start publishing as much as I can on, on this. I'm, uh, these slides will go out um, I've already put them up on SlideShare um, and I'll, I'll link them out and um, you're welcome to steal and use whatever you can. Um, the, the full diagnostic question sets, we're working on trying to publish a first set um, really soon, probably in the next month or so. Um, and, and, and as we get that big, bigger and bigger set, we'll invite, start to invite people to come on and help us increase the library of evidential information sitting behind each box so that we can go in and go, hey, I want to look up what's in that box and I can get the top 10 questions and the top you know, 50 bits of li literature I should potentially be aware of. Um, but um, the, the, where I would start using at the moment is try and just think you know you about the nine boxes think about whether or not um i am considering all of those kinds of elements when i'm when i'm talking about a change with my team or or designing a change make sure i have considered the systems effects do a causal map draw out as many circles as you possibly can across a large wall or a mirror board or and, and make sure that you're thinking about the ongoing possibilities of the change I'm about to make or the recommendation I'm about to make to my team. And don't just assume it's a nice mechanical thing that when you put in story points, it won't have some other flow on effect. Um, and prioritize left and prioritize up if you can. Think about what systems are going to be there that are going to be affecting my team because we don't want to make my t uh, my team's life any harder. So, so those are my kind of key starter places, um, and I'm I'm trying to write stuff down and push out and involve um, more of a community over the next few months. So, thank you. For some reason, that that biological metaphor really kind of resonates with me. It's it's a great way of thinking. You know, if I'm to make a change over here, if I'm going to introduce this change, what sort of an impact is it going to have on our organizational biology? You know, it's a good way of thinking about it. Pretty apt at the moment as well, I think. Uh, so uh, some comments here. Sundra Hessen says, thank you so much, Doug. Very insightful. Can we have a list of books if you have consolidated them to be shared, please? That would be useful. Thank you. How many books would you like on the list? <laughs> All of the books. I hope you get the book, book vouchers, reading tokens, and whatnot for Christmas, and then uh, you might get through some of them. I'll um, again. Those the slide deck will be there with the ones that I just put up in those little categories that I that I showed you, and you can just look at the slide deck and pick the covers and uh, and go that way, and that'll give you about fifty. Um, but uh, if you really want to dig into a very specific area, um, just ping me, and I can I can definitely send you back 
some suggestions. I'm also sure that if we quickly ping to this community, um, I, I guess, uh, Simon, you guys must have some form of channel that you interact on. Um, if you ping to this community and said, here's the thing I'd like to know more about, I'll bet you you get 10 book um, answers back very, very quickly. <laughs> True enough. Okay, that's it for questions. <clears throat> just a couple of comments to uh, finish up with. Uh, and just, yeah, thanks from people for the wonderful talk, very insightful. Uh, from David, seems like creating the optimal sustainable number of adjacent possibilities is a wise strategy. Um, Barry, in terms of book recommendations, recommends Mindset by Carol Dweck. Definitely recommended. Uh, and that's it for the questions. So I think we are back to Gordon. I'll mute myself. Excellent. So, yeah, thank you ever so much, Doug. I think, um, you know, just uh, you know, the comments around the books and, and things like that shows the depth of research that you've put in there. It's, uh, yeah, really enlightening for me. Um, so thank you very much. Um, so, and thank you to everyone that has uh, joined this evening. Um, again, your participation's um, greatly welcomed. Um, and, you know, this, this isn't the same without, without you. Uh, Sorry. So having a look back over uh, the previous uh, year, um, you know, it's been a very strange year, obviously starting out uh, when we were, we were all together and, and going online. I think uh, the fact that we, we can't meet each other has, has sort of resulted in us actually meeting more people from a wider, um, wider reach across, across the globe in some cases. So um, strange year and we've met lots of new people, which is great. Um, so some been some awesome um, sessions uh, during 2020. Um, so hopefully we'll, we'll be continuing with more in the new year and we'll let you know uh, what's coming. Um, so I think from uh, all of us at CAE, we'd like to wish you all a, a great Christmas uh, and, and festive season. And um, hopefully we can all meet in person again at some point uh, in, the, in, the, in the new year. So thank you very much. And please don't forget the, the Twitter and the Slack channels. Get in contact if you want uh, and keep the conversation going. So thanks again, Doug, and thank you, everyone.